hope you're all doing extremely well. I know I am. I know this man is. Hell yeah. Mr. Every Paul. Day. Thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> Thank you for having me, man. This is going to be a lot of fun. This is going to be a lot of fun. Look, we've already got a little bit of hate in the chat. Look at this. Look at this. Uh, already. Harem, harem sound exhausting. Oh, Davina. <laughs> It's not exhausting for you. You're, you know, it's not exhausting for you. Actually, it's great for you because you, you get to go do your own thing and not have to worry about, you know, trying to be in your man's crap all the time. You know what I mean? You can do you can be you. You can go do your thing. It's the biggest complaint, you know, women have in their relationships. One of the biggest ones is that they, you know, they lose themselves, right? They can't like, you know, they can't live their own lives. Well, if you have, if a guy has several women and she's enjoying several women with him, she can go and, you know, do her work, pursue her dreams, do her stuff with a companion. It's very non-toxic actually. And very not, it's very not exhausting, actually. That's the thing about it, but people don't understand. If it's done right, you know, without drama and BS, then it's 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 actually much easier to manage than even a monogamous relationship. Although I don't tell people not to do monogamous relationships. Those are fine, if that fits you, you know? Well, <laughs> I'm sold. We're done. All right, fine. Done. Yeah, yeah. All right, sweet. <laughs> I'm sure our Davina's sold, too. I'm sure she is. I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> so maybe uh, give everyone who is new to you and your your work or even your background, maybe give everyone a bit of a, an understanding of your background, where you've come okay. from. Uh, yeah, yeah. What, you, the, the what little... you're known for, what you kind of teach guys as well, and then we'll right. move on from there. Absolutely. So a little Batman origin. So yeah. I, um, so I'm a military person, right? So I was, I've been in the special operation side of it, as well as the conventional side, mostly basically doing combat stuff. So we'll just kind of leave it at that. So think of what combat tours and having to shoot at people and having to shoot back at you. That's most of what my military career has entailed in that, uh, being a non-commissioned officer, you're dealing with soldier care issues. And so you're dealing with soldiers, problems and issues and things at home. Could be financial, could be whatever life stuff. In that comes up relationship stuff. Now, it seems like the more, um, you know, sort of tip of the spear, put yourself at risk kind of units you're with, uh, the more guys that have sort of a hedonistic mentality Mm. Or, or they have like, you know, they, they're, they're the ones who are going to wife up the stripper or the bartender who's already slept with 12 of their friends. You know, they're the ones who are, gonna, you know, they're going to captain save a ho. So you have these guys who put themselves on the line, you mm. know, put themselves, their lives on the line. And then they think, okay, well, I met this girl who's, you know, basically not a good choice for a long-term partner, but I'm going to save her from herself, yeah. wife her up, you know? And so you run into that. And then, and then what ends up happening is they end up, it's that scenario where she, he's getting a video sent to him while he's on a deployment where she's banging his friend or mm -hmm. he's coming home to bank accounts cleared out and, you know, the kid's gone and, you know, stuff gone from, from deployments or just various cheating scenarios, various, just, just lots of, you know, uh, taking resources from this guy, screwing him over a lot, like a lot of toxic stuff, a lot of problems. And then of course it affects a guy's ability to perform in his job. But not only that causes a lot of suicides. So mm. every military suicide I've gone to, they're mostly men. I th well, really, every situation has been a man except for one, okay? And men kill themselves five times more than women. I mean, it just is. And there's a whole re bunch of reasons we could talk about if we want to about that, why that is. And, and in each case for these military people, it was a broken relationship. It was a misunderstood paradigm. I'm not saying it's the girl's fault, even if she was a toxic girl. It's never her fault that the guy decides to kill himself. However... She was a contributing factor to his problems. She was a, a, a harm rather than a help. So that got me into, for, well, it started really me trying to figure out myself and figure out women. And because and, I made my own series of mistakes, I went from being terrible with women when I was young, we're talking high school and early college, to figuring, doing what most guys do, figuring some stuff out, 
you know, being good with some stuff, but being bad with other stuff. And then I got into that marriage. And of course, my sense of duty, you know, I'm going to take care of this person. I'm going to do all this stuff for this person. And of course, that led to uh a what we call a blue pill marriage and a sexless marriage you know and so guys who go like they see my lifestyle now and they go well he's this you know whatever i don't think this about myself but other people he's this good looking guy you know he's built he's got like all the black pill type people right he's got all these things going for him so of course he has women he has no problems with women i can't do that well that's wrong because Mm -hmm. when i did when my mindset wasn't right and my game was wrong I got the same results as every, we could say, blue-pilled guy gets, which is a sexless marriage, terrible relationship, chick that doesn't really, you know, that is just bitchy, needy, bosses you around, you can never make her happy. And the thing is, like, not to, I'm not disparaging, actually, my ex-wife in this, because her and I get along awesome now. Mm. The problem was me. The problem was how I handled women. And I'm in the leadership role as a man, And the way I handled her, the way that society and the way I was conditioned to handle a woman. And there's, of course, some there's some evolutionary traits that kick into that sort of supports that narrative caused me to be in a situation where she wasn't happy. I wasn't happy and nothing was working. I'm now gaming women the right way. I say gaming, but I mean, really handling women the right way. She is in a great relationship with me as my ex. And we do, you know what I mean? It's like the most non-toxic X scenario you can imagine. So Mm -hmm. as men, we're in a lot of, we have a lot of power here. We just need to understand what that power is and how to use it. So I started off not so good, started figuring things out. 20 years ago, got into psych. I was in grad school for psychology, left it for combat, never went back because I started getting into evolutionary psych and my interest was relationship psychology. And I realized that regular academia is totally broken when it comes to handling men and women, sexual dynamics. It's just totally off. And, and I thought, well, what am I going to do? That, why am I going through these emotions? You know, I get, a, I get a master's or even a doctorate in psychology, and I work in a prison somewhere diagnosing prisoners and making $70,000 a year. It seems stupid to me, you know, to go through that much schooling, get that much in debt to do something that I'm not interested in. And then I do, if I do relationship counseling, the paradigm that the APA follows or the counseling community follows or even social working community follows is completely off. You mm-hmm. know, it assumes men and women are the same. You yeah. know, that's a big narrative. Yeah. You know, and it's, it, it doesn't understand that there's difference in our wiring, which evolutionary psychology does understand. So I got into evolutionary psych. I got to pick up and game. I turned the marriage around actually and was in a went from zero sex to all of the sex and everything was going well, I chose to leave it because we weren't that compatible. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that I, it was my choice. It wasn't a choice that like where she was leaving, you know what I mean? It was, it was like, no, I, you know, I, I need to do something different. And of course I made a lot of mistakes in figuring that stuff out. And then after that, it was figuring things out, hitting the dating market, doing the pickup thing. But with working with soldiers, I was, mm-hmm working with them and helping them with their stuff that led to coaching and all that add some ptsd counseling and stuff with soldiers add to now i'm getting into the mindset stuff right and then i had a lot of training when i was at fort bragg when i was prepping to be in the special operations community that were almost like sports psychology but for you know operators you know Hmm. how do how do we reduce stress and you know, increase our ability to be a better operator performer when we have to actually go under fire, right? Have to go into a crisis site. So I got really interested in that and started working on the side more or less for myself and just sort of figuring it out, you know? And I got certified in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, hypnotherapy. So I'm actually a, a hypnotherapist, licensed master hypnotherapist, just like, you know, good friend Ryan who in our circles does that too, does a really good job. Thank there you. he is. Buddy. There he is. There's Ryan. But <laughs> Ryan's my boy. He does an excellent job, by the way. He did a session with me. Yeah. So if you do it, like I do, I do the things for myself that I do for other people. 
and he hooked me up. I had like a barrier I was running into, you know what I mean? And, and he, we, we did a session and I did a session for him actually and hooked him up. So we are working together. We're actually going to do a course probably next year. So awesome guy. Okay. Um, yeah. And then EMDR is trauma therapy. So that's, uh, you know, that stands for, um, basically it's, it's, it's your re you're reprocessing uh, trauma is, is what it is EMDR. So, um, and so I, I started working on helping dudes get, their mindset in order because what i found was that what was missing like everyone as a man they want to tap into this alpha presence you know they want to tap into they want to be more alpha right well that's something that happens here first you know and then then from here it starts to cause your behaviors and it causes your reactions to the world around you yeah. so how you're framing the world how you react and your actions that is what you know makes you more alpha well you have to have your mindset in order you have to have that outcome independence and so well when you have damaged trauma from you know most guys are not you and not me right they've been they've been screwed over by women dude they don't do well with women and so they have trauma they have damage there you know what i mean and then that ends up setting the framework for their next encounter their next relationships and they continue to fail and so we want to undo that stuff. We want to get a different mindset, a different framework. There's a logical framework like reading, for example, Rolo Tomasi's book or doing a Rule Zero conference, you know, listening to your channel, listening to my channel, getting better as a man. That's all good stuff on a, on a rational side. But there's emotional and unconscious conditioning we need to do too. And that's where the mindset stuff. So that's why I have Apex Mindset because I'm helping guys get – really recondition their brain, you know, so they can recondition their behavior to end up doing them what they want. Now at the rule zero conference, I was talking about harems. So that was a whole, so I think we want to get into that a little bit because that was kind of the <laughs> advertisement here. Right. And so what I found in a lot of research in, we'll say get going through a lot of women, um, I'm not a porn star, so I don't have your notch count, but I'm not as far off as one might think. Yeah. So I remember you reported, I think it was like, I, know, and I knew that about you as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it, it's my, my, my not, it's almost embarrassing. Like, it's like, that's a lot, <laughs> you know, like I was not want to like, you know, I'm not, I'm not a porn star. So I'm not as like used to be as open as you are. So I'm like, Fuck, that's a lot of people, <laughs> you know, but in that though, you learn a lot of stuff, you know? And what I found was that women were very open to when they saw you as the alpha guy they wanted to bang right not the long-term relationship guy that beta guy or whatever they were very open to threesomes like it was just like automatically like oh like we'll bring another girl in oh that's cool like they were cool with that as mm -hmm. long as they like knew that they were still going to have sex with you and that they were going to have this it just became about the experience well, I started researching that from an evolutionary psychology perspective like there's got to be a driver so whenever you see a, a common thread, not just some outlier, like this person, I don't know, likes toes or whatever. Well, you know, that's an outlier, right? Or whatever. But when you see like a, a trend, you got to go, okay, there's, this is a common behavior I'm seeing with a lot of women. So there's got to be a drive behind it, a primal drive, because their sexual decisions are driven by primal mating decisions from our evolution. So that's what evolutionary psychology talks a lot about. So okay, women seem to be have a predisposition to liking other women. Most women are on a spectrum with their sexuality. Most women are not, I mean, most women, even straight women have experimented or thought about other girls, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or have been open to it. Whereas guys, I've noticed it's more binary. It's more like you got homosexual men. There's very few that would consider themselves bi, but statistically, you know, that's very small. Or, mm -hmm. or and then you have your heterosexual. Yeah. Guys are not quite on that spectrum, it seems, whereas women are very freely on that spectrum. And it's even more acceptable for that in a society for them to be on that spectrum. So I'd ask. I even get that with a lot of girls in my industry who'll be like, who yeah. will be like lesbian for pay. <laughs> right. Yeah. But they, but they don't do it in like a begrudging way. It's not like uh -huh. they, they don't date women. Right. But, Okay, put them. In, they'll have a fun time with like another chick on camera. And here's the way you can always tell if it's two kind of straight chicks doing lesbian mm -hmm. porn, yeah. is they'll always compliment each other a lot. They'll be like, "Oh okay. my god, you're so pretty. I love your hair. I love your nails." <laughs> like just sit there and compliment one another a bunch. 
<laughs> Whereas if they're, actually, if they're actually into chicks, right. if, they're, if they're far more bisexual or even or even they would consider themselves to be lesbian, then they're yeah. just like ravenous. Yeah. It's totally different. Right. That's that's very interesting observation, actually. Um, and and yeah, so, well, with women, I, so I looked at it and I looked at, well, what was our evolution? So we were polyamorous before, which means, you know, that everyone kind of screwed everybody, you know, banged everyone in the small tribes that were hunter-gutter tribes. Yeah, what book, what, there was, there's a book that talks a bit about this. Um, there's a couple one of them. Um, you have uh, Sapiens is one. And um, Sex at Dawn? Sex of Dawn talks about it. Sex of Dawn is kind of, he's not really a scientist though. So I'm kind of mm. like, meh. you yeah. know, some of his stuff's okay, but I, I don't know. There's better stuff out there. Yeah. Sex of Dawn I have read. And then I had, like you said, I had heard some critiques of Sex at Dawn. And I, yeah. there, was one, there was one really interesting part of Sex at Dawn. Sperm Wars is another good one. Sperm Wars. Yes, is really Sperm good. Wars is good. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it was a really good yep. thing. I think it's in Sex at Dawn where he talks about female. Uh, copulatory vocalization. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and I think David you... Buss talked about this. So David Buss yeah. is a really prominent um, evolutionary psychologist. Had a lot. He got me started. Is, female yeah. copulatory vocalization is just <laughs> a scientific term for when a woman is screaming while she's orgasming. Right. The premise behind the theory is that, like, why one? Why would a woman scream when she's orgasming? Like, what's right. the biological? Like, because dudes, dudes make noise, but they don't make as much as much noise as women do. No, no. as much dudes are like, I <laughs> right? right? Yeah, and maybe when they're climaxing, they might be like, Nah, okay, kind of like a <laughs> right, but yeah. chicks are like moaning and groaning quite a lot the whole time. So, yeah. what's the biological background behind this? And the theory is that it's, yeah, like we're in we grew up, we, we evolved in somewhat polyamorous society, so it's like mm -hmm. as chicks getting a raw dogged, uh, <laughs> she's making sound to attract other males to come in. Yeah, basically for sperm competition, so that right one dude dumps a load, the next dude comes and dumps a load, the next dude comes and dumps a load, and the sperm fight each other inside her inside her body. Correct. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's yeah. Well, that that's interesting. Like we want to go on that tangent. That got uh, all kinds of because you have your book, which by the way, your book is awesome. I Thank love you. it. I Thank love you. your book. It got everyone watching this channel. If you don't have his book, you better buy it like right now because it's not, you didn't prep that. We didn't talk about this before. I am endorsing it hundred percent because it, you, you got, I, st so experiences, right? I was not good with women. Like I said, when I was younger, I was very, I was, you know, raised by a single mom and I was told all the traits that I need to have to be good for a woman were all of the very weak beta traits. Mm -hmm. I was a, a, an alpha kind of a person in the sense that I was like the blue pill alpha. I was this, I was in combat sports. I was doing martial arts real heavy, heavy, you know, I was competitive kickboxer, boxer. I was a guy who's like, I'm going to kick some masks for my lady, that guy, you know yeah. what I mean? I I'm was in it. I was in the right there. Right. Yeah. I was in the fun party guy. who's going to like score you some weed and then, you know, bang in some dirty uh, couch somewhere. Right. I was the guy, you know, like that's the guy they want. That's the guy they all wanted. I was the guy who was like, is someone you mean, hurting like, you? Like this kind of couch. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like the, yes. Casting couch. I was not the casting couch guy uh, back in the day. And and so I, I got walked on by women. It was terrible. But when I finally, I finally had some chicks score me, really, because I was terrible, so bad at it. <laughs> she was, was when I was 19 years old. It took me that long to actually get laid. And um, she was like the town whore, you know, like she had like, and, and she, and so with her, I, I had my first sexual experience and I was halfway decent from the get go. And I started learning a lot about sex with her because she was so experienced, but she was also insane, you know? And, and so she was well, surprised, right? The one with all the notch counts in town. And so she, it was like a point where I needed, like she was having, we were having sex like all the time, like almost every day, you know? And so like, I, I, I finally had exams going on and I had to study and I was like going to fail. Like if she didn't get the chick away from me because she was like spending so much time with me. And so I, I kind of told her, I said, listen, stay away from me for this week. Like I can't have you around. Right. I did that. And then she banged two of my friends at a party friends. Right. Yeah. <laughs> at the same time and talk smack about me. 
sexually. Mm. Mm, right? Like, yeah. So, oh, he can't hang sexually. So I need you two to bang me out in all my holes. And so that was, I'm like, ooh. Now, so to have your first chick. Now, I wasn't in love with this girl. I, I knew that this was, I knew what she was. I kind of understood what was happening. Mm. But at the same time, that attack, like when a woman attacks you sexually. It's a low blow. She, it's a low blow. Well, she's attacking your genetic capability to procreate. It mm. hits your you at a primal level as a man, you know. So you have to really work on your outcome independence and that stuff. Which you, as a porn star, you know the, how this works because you're just putting yourself out there all the time. Most, which is awesome, by the way, to have you as a resource because you're in you know what i mean because guys don't like i mean that level of of outcome independence is is important because guys put way too much weight on what some some chick thinks about them and chicks mm. make terrible decisions most of the time when it comes to their mating decisions we know this and so <laughs> i'll tell you you can tell this, you can tell this because they all talk smack about their exes of course <laughs> And say how the guy you picked. They say <laughs> oh, how trash their exes are. <laughs> yeah. They all say shit like, why is toxic dick the best dick? <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. Because you're a you're terrible them. decision maker. That's why. Because <laughs> you, when you, you, she could be the smartest woman in the planet. And then when she's going to make a sexual decision, it's a chimpanzee that yeah. takes over it's yeah. a primal yeah. brain and it's just like <laughs> flinging poo and throwing her vagina out there like it's just it doesn't have it it's like you know and then and then and then like and then they're like what happened to me i don't even know what i'm doing right that's most women so that person her opinion of you is garbage you know now we can look at uh overall data and opinions right to see okay am i doing well sexually or not right we can look at that stuff but one singular person's opinion in an emotional state like when a girl's cheating on me because she feels abandoned because they won't talk to her during my exam week and, and decides to only, like that's her only <laughs> that's her only chick game yeah is, is to go and fuck another dude that's it. right you not got any other way to like two go, dudes, two dudes, <laughs> and a party. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not like, can I compromise? Can I like, okay, right. I'm taking up a lot of his time and like it's distracting his work. No. Can I find some compromise? Can I like uh, yeah. give him companionship? Can we just get together next week? No, I'm just gonna <laughs> take two other men and make him right. jealous instead. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Which, of course, you know, I was at least smart, smart enough back then. I just broke up with her. I'm like, you suck. <laughs> you know, like, and she came back for sex from me. I'm like, thanks. But then from that point, I think yeah. that it's it's even worse to be like the dude who gets sex, who, who doesn't even get sex from like the town slut. Yeah, it's even yeah. It, it's like it's bad. It's bad. Yes, it's bad being like in the situation. You described, but it's even worse to be the dude you won't even go near. Oh in yeah, more country. Yeah, that's even worse. <laughs> absolutely, it's like it's like wow. Like she was had sex with everybody, but not me. <laughs> What's wrong with me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so I you know I was just I didn't have my crap. I mean, I looked physically, I was in good shape. I wasn't as like big. Like I'm bigger, muscular than I am now. I was much smaller, mm. but I was still a competitive fighter. So I mean, I had my abs. I was in good shape. I looked okay, and she just. You know, she was working in an office near mine and just was like, I'm going to have sex with this guy. It's pretty much her, how her brain worked. And then she made that stuff happen. That's how it happened. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, I very little, I, I was good socially. I just, my, my game just wasn't good because I was always trying to protect women. And it was like this crazy thing. Right. Yep. And so, um, but once she did that, I was like, I'm never going to let another girl do that again and make me question myself. Because at the time, I was like, I don't know. She's my first sexual partner. I don't have a ton of experience. And I was, she used to be like, holy crap, we're like in a porn together the way that we bang sometimes, you know. But, you know, I, you know, I, I, I don't, there's a lot I don't know, right? Sex is a skill too. And so I ended up studying and getting into how to get better at that skill set very early. And I found that keeping frame with women whether it's a harem style situation or a monogamous situation, whatever, the level of sexual experience you can create for her is a big part of that. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And if you can create a strong impacting sexual experience for her, that's going to create a strong emotional reaction, neurochemical reaction. And it's much easier to have this girl in your frame and to, to have her be happy with you in a relationship. That's what we want. Mm-hmm. And so I learned that I figured that early on. And that's so I got into, I was reading books on Tantra, BDSM. Like I was going to like buy, you know, it was, I'm older than I look, maybe. So, you know, I was—I wasn't even internet searching this stuff. I was book. I was finding books, finding information, you know, and studying this stuff. And then I come across you no. Know, so with that, you come across a lot of BS, you know, stuff that's mm-hmm. just so total bull crap. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it, it's what I found, like in the tactical shooting community, martial arts, any kind of thing that guys have an ego investment in. Uh, there's like a, a like a ton of bullshit bullshit that goes like with the, it because like the look dojos yes yeah because it's all yeah it's all ego right and it's not they, they don't want to deal with reality and so yeah. sex is like that too in the bdsm community you run into that like people have their 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 personal sense of worth is like based on their sexual powers as a dom or whatever and they suck you're like they, they and then what they're putting out is garbage and so you're like <laughs> and so you you sort of exp- you got to get out in the field and and do stuff just like mm-hmm. A military person, I'd go out in the field and do combat missions. I find out very quickly what was garbage in training yeah. and what wasn't. You know, you get into fights or something because you're working in, in a profession where you fight, like in this kind of security or, you know, corrections, different things where you have to actually put hands on people. You find out very quickly, you know, okay, that, that stuff we trained was crap. And you start vetting it out, right? So as a porn star, you've been able to do that. You vetted out what is good and what isn't, and you put mm-hmm. it in a book. Like I read, I read your book and it was like, wow, that's all the crap that took me years to figure out. <laughs> you know what I mean? It and so, book. Yeah, in a book. <laughs> Look, so buy the book. Come take me, the shortcut. <laughs> it took me years to figure it out too. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, in, the of sense of, in the sense of learning it, learning to do it on camera as well all the tricks and techniques that i've sort of picked up along the way because i was like right. i said look I've, I've i basically picked the brain of every dude who was better at this than me or who has had more experience at this than me right since day one so i'm constantly like trying to learn from other dudes and that's yeah. where you get, you get to that a, point but you're right you're right about there being complete bullshit advice out there and it's it's kind of like you, you're right when you say people have it wrapped up in their ego because you if you take i did an episode on this uh about a week ago where i right. just all I did was I Googled like sex advice for men and I looked at like the one of the top articles and it was this sh- piece of trash, <laughs> absolute piece of trash. And I sat down, I did a whole hour episode breaking it down. And what, and, but you can tell it's the people who are, who are given this advice, it, they're, they're ego invested because it's stuff like do the dishes at home <laughs> and then she'll give you anal sex like no like, what? That's, not how this that's not how this works no no <laughs> you're like, and then you, you take one look to like uh you take one second to look at the author like the person who's giving this advice and it's right. some fat schlub sitting up in like a university high tower like at a sociology degree you're like oh right. this sense like this like this guy's whole like sexual model is based around negotiating for pussy Right. Yeah. Transactional, so the course, lowest level of sex. Yeah. So of course <laughs> he's going to protect his ego and be like, the way I do it is the correct way, obviously. So mm-hmm. do the right. dishes, <laughs> gentlemen. My wife loves me. When I do the dishes, I get a blowjob on my birthday once a year. Yeah. That's- as as I do the dishes every week. <laughs> yeah. It's like, <laughs> wow. Sounds awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's, um, yeah. Let's let's pivot a little bit. Let's talk about so sure. let's talk about your current relationship setup, which is okay. obviously a harem. Spoiler alert. Uh and I guess like sort of how you put it together. Because I think that's gonna be okay. something that you guys will really, really enjoy hearing about. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about a hypothetical relationship setup for the purpose of YouTube. The reason why, and oh. this is very important. This is yeah. very important. This is good. I'm glad that we asked it in this way because this is actually very important. And is that discretion is really important when you're setting up a harem style relationship the way that I might have that set up might. Okay. The way I've done this before, we'll say. Mm-hmm. We'll say I've done it before. The reason why discretion is really important is because you exist in a society that is taking a what we could just slang term it, blue pill narrative, right? 
it's the monogamy, marriage narrative, whatever. And even when, like, even though things are being more open and there's like swingers and polyamory is now becoming more acceptable, it's a female driven polyamory. It's not a male driven one. Mm, so, absolutely. right. So, so I, they'll see you as this misogynist a hole. Not only that, is the like when you source women, let's say, so in, in this structure, okay, LTR, there's, there's a couple different structures. There's a couple different structures for harems. One is that you're not in it, they're, you're in a non serious relationship. You could call it spinning plates, dating, right? Whatever. And, so you bring two different women together that you're not serious about, you know, and you have threesomes with these two women, or maybe a, there's another woman, a third, whatever, you know, you bring in, you're having sex with multiple women and they're not serious, they're casual relationships. So that's one structure. Another structure is the long-term relationship where you have a long-term partner, very much like a monogamous partner, you, you, you're actually, for all intents and intents and purposes, you're monogamous. She's not sleeping with other dudes. You're not sleeping with other women without her being a part of that equation. Even if you were to be outside of the relationship to sleep with another woman, she knows about it, you know, and, and is consenting to it. And so, and then you're bringing in women into the bedroom. So the women you're bringing into the bedroom are usually, they can be more permanent, like, they they kind of come in like regularly or they become, they become like a girlfriend to both of you right exactly or more like you know one-off scenarios now back to discretion a lot of these girls don't want to be in a a third you know or fourth maybe uh uh chick or fifth whatever but you know chick in a, a in a relationship they don't want to be like the the second third or fourth girl yeah they definitely so, don't want, they don't want that title publicly definitely they don't want that at all right. well because they're they're pursuing so so this goes back to strategic pluralism or what we understand is alpha you know bangs you know beta pays right mm -hmm. um the, to censor for youtube so you know, they want the alpha sex, but they want to find that secure guy to marry, have kids with, have this guy take care of them. So when she's like wants to be on the dating market to find that engineer or attorney or whoever in your social group who's going to pay for all her crap and let her achieve her dreams, she doesn't want that guy to know that she is getting like Chad slammed by me and my girlfriend. You know what I mean? Like she doesn't want like that part to, to be out there. So she needs to have some discretion. She needs to be able to do something like on the down low without these, her, you know, she wants to be able to date and, and pursue the beta relationship while mm. she gets her sexual needs met and she gets to kind of, you know, kind of explore things a little bit with a guy who she's sexually attracted to and a woman she's sexually attracted to. And so, so that discretion is really important. And then you run into what about like, for example, my long-term relationship, if potentially hypothetically I was in a harem relationship, would what would happen to her dad found this on YouTube or her family, right? That would be a huge problem, right? Mm. So we just I I don't actually talk unless we're behind a paywall, you know, and then we can keep some discretion. I don't talk about my personal relationships very often on YouTube. Be, and, and if guys want to pursue this, they need to learn how to have that discretion. And it goes into you learn it when you're the alpha, alpha, alpha lays guy. Because you learn that women don't like guys that kiss and tell, so to speak. They want that discretion. They want to have their sexual needs met by this dude they're banging without having any societal repercussions for that. And if you're out there talking about her, being like, yeah, so I'm banging this girl. She comes over whenever her boyfriend's out of town. You know what I mean? Like, that's not going to yeah. work. Yeah. And, so, and so she wants to do things, you know, without having guys kiss and tell so to speak so if you're out gaming women and just dating women whatever you don't want to be that kiss and tell guy period that's discretion you need to apply that to any kind of harem style relationship but so that's but that's a structure and what i found was that when you're the alpha lays guy 
women just want to explore and do whatever with you because they're with you for sex primarily. Mm-hmm. They're not with you because they are planning a future. Well, what can happen is they're with you. The best way, in my opinion, what I advise is that you are there with you for sex first. They're with you for that, at least that sexual desire or that draw. And then they start liking you and they start seeing the long-term potential. And then if you like her and you see that long-term potential in her, then you allow that to develop, you know? Hmm. That's the best way because otherwise women are negotiating their other desires and goals for, you know, they're negotiating that with you, meaning they've had better sex before, they're more sexually attracted to other people, Mm. but they like you because you might be a good dad and you're a nice guy, you're a good provider, all that stuff. Women make that negotiation all the time. They all, they, they, that's strategic pluralism, which Mm. is they want to bang this guy over here. They want to bang the Sterling Cooper or the Paul Benjamin, right? Or in the harem or whatever. But then, but they, but they want to settle with, you know, Bob the engineer, who's kind of a dork and cleans the gutters out on Saturday or whatever the hell he's doing. You know what I'm saying? And, and so they want that stable guy that's going to provide children and all this stuff, but really they want to bang someone else. And they make that negotiation. Whenever they do that, they're never happy. They're never happy in that mm-hmm. long-term relationship. And especially today in a global sexual marketplace where women are not happy just living in their coal mining town, pregnant and barefoot, cooking dinner for some guy waiting for him to come home. Yeah. They're on Instagram seeing the best life happening and they they want to go on their eat, pray, love tour after they've spit out a few kids. <laughs> they want to go to Greece, find the bus boy to bang and um, live their best life, right? That's what they want if they're not sexually happy in the relationship. So if a guy does not want to get zeroed out, if a guy does not want to get taken to the cleaners, he needs mm. to make sure he's her sexual best first. And then from there, the rest can be other goals she can meet with that guy. Yeah. And so that's why the work you're doing is so important because guys need to learn how to be a girl's sexual best. I've been saying this for a long time, but interesting well, that we avoid the conversation in a lot of these uh Red yeah. circles. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we do, and it's like no one wants to talk about the sort of elephant in the room, right? right? Which is yep. that, like, because Rollo, I mean, Rollo to, to to coin phrases from Rollo Tomasi, he always talks about like being, like, she'll have like a an alpha widow in her past, mm-hmm. right? Which is the right. dude who fucked her the best, basically. That's what or, it is. Or, yeah. or it's like the the dude who was like a minor celebrity or a celebrity of some kind. So like he was a, mm. he was like an athlete. He was a rapper. He was a fucking youtube star whatever i don't care right but he's he, got, he got, created the like the most impacting emotional reaction for her That's he was like was. he's he is without a doubt the, mm-hmm. the highest value dude that she has had sex with in her life and yep. after she's had that every other dude pales in comparison compared to it that's right so the, you have a problem on your hands mm-hmm. uh, and the problem only really manifests if a woman has a significant gotcha. sexual past a significant right. Right, enough yep. mm-hmm. it's, it's that the alpha that she's she's alpha widowed to some dude. So right. there's, two, there's there's like two kind of solutions to that, right? One is like, okay, we'll try and find virgins. Good luck with that. Right. <laughs> so right. In the Western world, good luck with finding a virgin. <laughs> right. uh, the second, this a second way around the problem is to up your sex game and be be a guy who gives her. And it, I don't mean. Oh, we lost your feed for a second there. Uh, you don't have to be like you don't have to have the world's biggest penis or anything like that to be her best sex ever. It it what it so it comes down to is ca- can you give her an emotional roller coaster? Can uh-huh. you give her a ver- like a variety of experiences she hasn't ex- she hasn't had before? Because even right. if, even if a girl is again to coin a co- uh, to borrow a phrase from Bola Tomasi on the cock carousel, even if she has had a a large sexual past, does not mean that there is a very that they've all like one up one another. Yeah. In that at all. Right. Uh, the vast majority of them are probably still banging like the average dude. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So yep. I'm curious. Have you do you have any you did you did touch you mentioned BDSM before. Have you got have you had experience in the BDSM scene yourself uh, and sort of as yep. a bomb to a degree? Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I got, I did a lot of research on that stuff. And, you know, after my marriage broke, my, 
my first relationship after that, I put a chick on a contract, you know, because this is right. Yeah, right, so please, this is right. Tell about this. I like this. I like this stuff. I'm, I'm, I, I half my, my talk, my conversation with Ryan Christensen a few days ago was about this stuff. And I have a friend, right. I have a friend back in Australia, oddly enough, and I mentioned this before, uh, I see this pattern with dudes from the military. All mm -hmm. the guys that I know, really? the professional doms, all ex-military, all of them. No kidding. I didn't all know that. Military. Right. And I got this, I've got a buddy back <laughs> in Australia. I've got a buddy in Australia who is a dom, and he currently has uh, five wives and two girlfriends under mm. contract in on his right. remote right. rural property in New South Wales. He runs a harem, a very efficient one. Okay. Um, so, nice. So, nice. Please elaborate on on the contract idea. Yeah. So this was more like she was, so this, this happened because I was exiting the marriage and I actually didn't like, I hadn't been on the dating market. I was like, what am I doing? You know? like, And so and then I meet, this, I meet this chick, like the second I separated from my, my wife, there's a separation, you know, more or less. Um, I, it was like two days later I had this girlfriend was like 20 it was she was like in my she'd been trying to like hook up with me and i've been like turning her down and finally i'm just like i just you know grabbed her out of the office and then basically told her what the deal was i was very direct you know what i mean i said i'm still married we're separated and i'm gonna have sex with other people and that's gonna be you <laughs> I was like, I was, <laughs> and she was just like Okay, she her, she goes. Okay, well that's hot. That was her answer. because yeah, she's twenty yeah. two years old. Like, <laughs> let's pause pause for a second there for the people in the back of the room, for the people in the back of the class right now. Okay, like that is that is, I one hundred percent guarantee you that is exactly how she said it too. She said it like that. She was like yeah. taken aback and then overwhelmed and like that's hot like deer in headlights kind of look because not many men have the balls to talk like that to tell to go right. to tell a woman exactly. look this is fucking what's going down all right it, and and <laughs> she still might reject right. the dude whoop you do but the fact that he's approaching it like that is what that's the secret source there uh but anyway right. please continue yeah, please continue. It. yeah and so and so that started off where so then it was basically that that was a conversation we knew we were going to have sex and then um, I, it turned into pretty much like she had to work. She's a bartender. And I'm like, all right, meet me at a hotel when you're done. So I was already like very used to just telling people what to do. And I just started telling women what to do. Yeah. And I found like with this one, but then I found, of course, later that this works really well. <laughs> like they, <laughs> they want to be told what to do, especially in a sexual situation. So I just told her like, yeah, so when you get off of work, you're going to meet me here. And then I'm going to break you in half. I think this was my exact terms. I think he used the F word, but whatever on YouTube. And so she was like, oh, my dream come true. And so she comes over and then like all of this pent up rage from being married and not happy went into her vagina. She was very happy with the experience. Like it was just like, and so it was just like, <laughs> it, it, it was it was a lot of rough stuff, you know, oh, oh, and um, a lot, just a lot of you know, just all the all the normal rough stuff that you talk about, you know, grabbing her hair, oh, smacking oh, her woman. ass, choking her, all that stuff, right? <laughs> I know, I oh, know, right? And she she oh. was like, holy crap. You know, yeah. and so I was at the time too because I had just I just gotten off of active duty. I was pursuing a career in real estate, so I was dressing up and going to an office every day. This is uh, you know, the the Fifty Shades and stuff like this is starting yeah. to become popular. So she was just like, "I really want this dominant." Like I really, and I was like, and I had I had already been researched on this. I had played around prior to the marriage. In the marriage, I played around with it towards the end. And so from doing just reading and research, you know, and so I went cool. And so I did a, you know, I just did a contract. Well, the contract is like, you don't have to do a contract. I don't do that now, in fact. Um, but what the contract does, it's, I do talk about this. It gives them a set of ideology to get behind. Mm -hmm. So a woman doesn't want to take blame or responsibility for her slutty behavior. Um, and I say slutty in the best possible way. 
Uh, it's great. Be slutty with your partner. Do it. Women, we love you. Do it. Right. Like it's not a, it's not a shaming thing, but they don't want to, you know, they've, they've evolved into being, they have to conceal their sexual proclivities or they will get murdered in societies up until recently. Yeah. I mean, even in places like Afghanistan, if those women in Afghanistan were to let these men know what their sexual desires and, you know, leanings were, they could be stoned to death. Yeah. And so they, the ones that survived learned to conceal that, learned to lie to themselves. This is why most women have no, like, they don't even understand what arouses them half the time. You know, porn girls, of course, being a little different because they're in that industry having sex for a living. But most con women conventionally don't really understand what arouses them. And then add a feminist narrative. They don't even understand that a dominant man is what they actually want until yeah. they're being told what to do in the bedroom. Yeah. And they're dude, being, you it's, know, it's so fucking uh -oh, obvious. I lost your uh, I lost you. Uh -oh, oh, can you hear me? Am I dead? Hang on, let me double check. Uh, in the chat, let me know if I'm still here. You got your mic in, bro? I can't hear you. Uh, I do, yes. Hang on, let me just check. Chat, can you hear me? That seems to be working. That seems to be working. Testing, testing. Alright, the chat says I can hear me. Uh, can you hear Paul? That's weird. I'm going to text you right now. Hey, Paul. Paul, I'm going to text you. Hang on. Uh, they can hear both of us. Uh, uh, let's, 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 here we go. Let's go. There we go. That's better. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah. Oh, now I lost him again. Yeah, jump uh, and back in again. How about this, guys? This happens every now and then. No big deal. We'll get back into it. Oops, I'm missing half of my moon. Where's my? There we go. Now we get the whole moon. Bam. Alrighty. There we go. Sorry. All right. <laughs> All right. <Great. laughs> Yeah, break. You, there's a there's a quick break. Water break. <laughs> YouTube, YouTube, you shut, us shut down. me down, probably. Too <laughs> <laughs> much truth, man. Bastards. Yeah. So, um, so what? What? Anyways, I was getting into this. So, this is about frame control. So, if you hmm. want to be successful in a long term relationship, be it monogamy or be it in a harem style relationship, you have to control the frame. So these women have more sexual partners than I'll get in the contract thing. I'll come back to it, I promise. Yeah, yeah. But these women have more sexual partners nowadays than they've ever had before. Even in polyamorous tribes, like you're talking tribes between 35 and 70 people. Yeah. She yeah. might have had five or six partners. Yeah, because the, the people who are of like dating age is, right. is not 50 people. It's like. Right. And so for a girl to get now, the average girl who is 30 years old today or less born after 1990, if she's 30 years old today, mm. she's had between 20 and 50 partners. That's very normal. She's not even a slut. That's just normal. Right. Well, she 60, 70 years ago, she would be unmarriable. Could you imagine a girl in the 1950s being like, yeah, I bang 20 people around town. Nobody would try to wife her up without knowing, like, without being told that they were taking the massive risk. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because it indicates an inability to pair bind. So guys are vetting for that naturally. And they, they it's the biggest threat for a man is being cucked, which is she bangs another guy and you find yourself raising someone else's kid. That disloyalty, you know, that that not having that loyalty is the biggest threat to a man. So notch count and all this stuff is a problem for men. Women mm -hmm. like to not take personal responsibility for their behavior. So they don't they hate that. They hate it when I talk about this. Your your, your people are watching this that are women. I hate that I said that. I'm not <laughs> trying to slut shame. I'm not. It's just, but this is a, an evolutionary reality, you know. And so notch yeah, count's exactly. a warning, son. Yeah. 
that's because women yeah. have been taught women have been taught with the with the whole feminist narrative that they've been brought up with for the last like 50 odd years that, right like, oh, if a man gets jealous it's because he's insecure that's because that's that's their go-to line it's like this go-to it's their script right. line right well mm-hmm. no unfortunately it's just uh like and I can, I can guarantee that every guy even dudes in my industry yep can develop jealousy despite the fact mm-hmm. that they might be in a relationship with a porn star and they're a porn star themselves. Like, because it's something, and that tells you something. It tells you something that's it's biologically hardwired into us. Yes. And that it, we, yes. we suspect we're being cucked. Mm-hmm. Alarm bells start ringing. Right. So that's, because, that's like, right. Yep. If we're back in caveman days, I might not be around very long. I might be, I might be eaten by a saber toothed tiger any day now. So yep. I, I would like very much to pass my genes on, you know, and I've only got a limited time frame to do it in. So if the girl mm-hmm. I'm banging is also banging Paul, <laughs> I'm probably <Problems>. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Well, and I, I always say this as an example, if, when a silverback gorilla beats up an opposing gorilla so that that gorilla can't mate with his top women in his gorilla tribe. Is he being insecure? Do we need to counsel that gorilla on his male insecurities? You know, like this is primal. He's protecting his paternity. And so when a guy gets jealous, it doesn't, it's when a woman gets jealous, it does come from insecurity because she knows the baby's hers. So that's not, there is no, you know, so for her, a woman's jealousy is based on, can I secure this man and his resources? Or is he going to leave me for a better option? Hmm. Which is completely based on how secure secure she is and her ability to keep this man. But for a dude, you know, it's, is she going to cuck me? And Hmm. that's, and she can do that covertly. And women do that even if the guy is her best option all the time. Mm. There's women that cheat all the time, opportunistically or whatever, because it's a wiring system. So, so, yeah. so for guys, it's a it's a territorial thing. It's protective, and I'm not saying security can't go hand to hand with jealousy for a lot of guys, but the the evolutionary origins of it is not. He doesn't feel like he's enough. No, I've observed many alpha guys who know they're enough who would beat the crap out of a dude for like looking at his girl. And I'm not, I don't suggest anyone does this kind of stuff, but you know, you see that stuff all the time. It's like, ah, yeah. that guy's pretty alpha. Pretty sure it's not yeah. just raw insecurity. There's something else going on here. That and so I, I, my, my friend Tom, Tom, who I had on the show a while ago, we discussed this is like the long, it's the biggest lie that's ever been told in like, not even maybe not even maybe less so like the whole manosphere space but before that like the pickup stuff mm. the idea of like pr- of mate guarding being beta yeah yeah you, you, you pick up any history book man and you look, <laughs> you look back do you think genghis khan wasn't mate guarding do you think julius caesar had didn't have concubines that he would murder over do you think let's mm-hmm. let's give any like popes ex Popes used to have yeah. concubines, and they used to, and they and they had fucking eunuchs and shit around. Them. <laughs> the whole point of eunuchs, yeah, there's a whole point of eunuchs. So other dudes you can protect your women, and other dudes can't impregnate them. Like yep. that's that's I can't think of a more extreme example of mate guarding than that. Right, like, right, right, right. It's been around since the, we we try to like whitewash our like <laughs> erase our history. Like like yeah. humanity has only existed for the last fifty years. No, right. I'm sorry, it hasn't. We've been around no. a lot longer than that. And there's a mm-hmm. lot of things that we've, a lot of habits, not even habits, but mm-hmm. you look at, uh, just look, look at the structures of societies and the structures of like, of alpha men in societies and right. how they went about their relationships. It yep. gives you a good indication of one, what's attractive to women and two, what we've been literally bred to do. Mm-hmm. And bred by women, mind you. Yeah, yeah, like, right. They're the ones selecting. So the dudes aren't the ones <laughs> popping the babies out. The women right. are the ones that are like sleeping with this guy to have his kids, and then mm-hmm. you're complaining in in 2020 that his kids are like alpha and like uh, <laughs> masculine. Well, you right. fucked him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did it. Yeah, of exactly. course they're gonna be like him. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Absolutely. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, if if you took an alpha male's woman. You know, or, or, you know, she would be killed, he would be killed, 
and his child, that offspring would be killed because that's probably the, the paternity is now in question. Yeah. I mean, this is a, we see infanticide in the animal kingdom and that was a big thing with humans as well. So this yeah. is a very strong, goes back to Dawkins and selfish gene, you know, that yeah, yeah. propagator genes, no matter what. And so this is a very strong drive. So, and it's not that the, the idea that it's insecure comes from female solipsism because they have a hard time understanding that because their jealousies from insecurity, well, male jealousy must be the same, but it's mm. not. Mm. And then, so that's part of it. And then the other part of it is it's a, it's a way to shame men so that they suppress that jealousy drive. So women can have open hypergamy, which is, which we basically oh, I, have <laughs> yeah, I secured this guy, but I'm going to bang this guy over here, have him pay for my crap. You know, that kind of behavior, right? Yeah. And so they want, even though women the women out there that don't have that, they're not going to do that because their value system doesn't allow it. Their primal chip brain wants the option. And so because they want that option, at least on a primal level, they want guys to be like, oh, like you do what you want. But the problem here too is that our jealousy drives, I talked about this on Rich Cooper's channel and a little bit on mine, but it needs to be talked about more actually is that our jealousy drives are primal, instinctual, and on overstimulated. They're overstimulated because mm. we're dealing with women with more notch counts than ever before in history, which is a challenge to our sexual ability to bond to her. And she has more sexual opportunities through the global sexual marketplace than any time ever in history. So our her hypergamy is not designed to handle all that stimulation. Yeah. And our jealousy drive is not designed to handle all that stimulation. And so this causes men to do a lot of behaviors that are detrimental to their happiness and ability to have good productive relationships with women. We see it in blue pilled world where they cling to those fantasies harder. You know, they stop trying, they stop putting effort in. That's the biggest problem women have with relationships is the man doesn't put the effort in. Why would he? You've been to 25 people, at least five to 10 of them had bigger, better, harder dicks than he does, right? <laughs> like, why? It's like, why? I'm not your best. And then you could go out and get somebody better. Why even get in shape? Why even be, I'm going to play video games. You know what I mean? And so it's not saying it's the right answer for that man. Obviously it's not, but but, but, you know, that's what happens. It's a despair because that jealousy drive goes on overdrive. They give up, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or they go turn to red pill stuff after getting screwed over a bunch of times. And then they go, they turn complete nihilism. It's just your, and I'm not crit criticizing because I understand why we have the phrases here, but you know, it's just your turn. You're not her best choice. You know, like spin plates don't ever be with a woman. Eh. You know, like women are terrible, you know, like you get this nihilistic behavior because it's, it's coming from the same thing. It's this, it's this, it's a jealousy thing. It's like, I'll never be enough. She'll always change up, whatever. It, it's an mm. over stimulation of that. So it, how takes do we over from, it takes away from the genuine joy that women can bring to your life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and there's a genuine This is not talked about a lot in this sort of space is that like, right. Women are a lot of fun. Dude, <laughs> wait, like I have great relationships with women. I love it. You know? <laughs> it's 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 just a great time. It's they're a compliment. Yeah. You're they're they're a compliment to you. One hundred percent. Um, but, I want, um maybe to, I want to, I want you to touch on um because you talk, talked briefly about frame control and I want I want to yeah. turn mm -hmm. that into how can guys uh better develop, I guess, loyalty from their part. Yes, 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 yes. But so, yeah, so it's all about emotional buy-in. She has to be emotionally bought into the relationship in you. She has to see you as her sexual best. And that means, so there's five categories, actually. Um, I've deduced this from a counselor, like in the 80s, that was observing stuff. And she had figured, well, wait a second. Women seem to be making mating decisions based on these five categories. And I thought it was very astute observation. She didn't understand the alpha beta dynamic. She wasn't an evolutionary psych. It was just an observational thing. I cannot remember her name. I wish I could, but I'd reference her. But the five categories were sexual gratification, that emotional gratification, which is her draw to him, you know, not his emotions to her, which is guys screw that up. 
that means he's alpha and she it draws to him emotionally. The third thing is security. Security is a couple different parts. One is, can you protect her? You know, can you, you know, and then the other one is, can he accumulate resources? And then would he use those resources on her? So that all encompasses security. And then the, the fourth thing was paternity, which was, would he be a good dad? And then the fifth thing is legacy, meaning it's kind of like loyalty, but would he discard her? Would he, you know, would he, for another younger model, you know, when she's 50 years old or something. So that's, that's, that's what she's vetting for. Now, depending, because people in general have a hard time holding two ideas at once in their head when they're making behavioral decisions, mm -hmm. especially when they don't even know that these things are in their head because they're primal. So what you have is one or two of these things will be in the forefront, depending on their age and part of their life. So 21 year old girls looking to get banged and she's looking for emotional stimulus and gratification where, you know, a 29 year old who's going to be 30 soon is going, Oh man, I need to get what I need to, if I want kids, I want a future. I need to make better decisions. You know, that's an epiphany stage. She's mm -hmm. looking at, you know, she starts to look more towards paternity and security you know, and she puts the sexual stuff on the back burner, which ends up being that negotiation we talk about now, right? Where she doesn't go for the guy that she's most sexually interested in, but goes for the guy that'll provide and be a good dad. Now, if she's been divorced already, kicked to the curb a few times, maybe she's 40 years old, she's not getting any younger, she's mm -hmm. looking for legacy, maybe that's in the forefront now. You know, who's this guy who's just going to be loyal to me? You know, I can't waste any more time. I can't waste my resources. I'll be alone when I'm 70. I need to secure this guy, right? And so these are the things that will come in the forefront. Now, she needs to see you as her best, back to frame control. She needs to see you as her best in all five categories, or it's a, or it's a hard stop. That's just it. So now it starts with the sex, though. It really does, because you can make yourself a better dad. You can make you can make yourself better sexually too, but you can make yourself a better dad. You can. But you get you get the impression of sex, like the first impression of the sex is the one that sticks, right? Like well, you, no. you, don't, you don't have to give your impression of being a dad until she, you actually are a dad, right? Right. Well, there's but, also a a chem yeah. There's also a chemical genetic component of sex though too. For, so for example, if she has got it like in her brain or you know, whatever her, whether it's her conditioning, whatever, if she needs a six foot three black guy, okay, she might enjoy sex with me, but I'm not a six foot three black guy. So I'm probably not going to be her sexual best necessarily. <laughs> and what she has, you know what I mean? I mean, maybe she, unless she changes her mind on what her, what would she imagines has her best, then mm -hmm. I'm not going to be it. The other component too, is there's a, there's a, a chemical component that we don't know a lot about we're still researching some of it has to do with pheromones they've talked about which is the ability to uh fight off disease that you could actually smell that in the other person what mm -hmm. that means is like if i have a baby with this person that baby's gonna be more resistant to disease than this other person i might have a baby with yeah. and so we can i uh the, i heard research on this and it was the, mm -hmm. the, the, the experiment i heard was they took they took a bunch of dudes uh, tell them not to wear any like perfume or colognes or anything for like 48 hours and wash right. really, mm -hmm. uh, with like non scented soaps and stuff. Right. Yeah. And then they got them all to wear basic white, plain white t-shirts and, and run on a treadmill for like an hour or something. So they built up mm -hmm. a sweat and sweat in the shirts. Then they yes. Put the shirts in bags, gave them and then gave those bags randomly to a group of women. Mm hmm. And the women ranked the mo the, the the shirts that smelt the best mm -hmm. to a woman were the guy that had the biggest difference in yes. uh, immune like uh, Immu immune antibodies immune, immune, immune antibodies yeah yeah the immune system yep. was was the, mm -hmm. the, the, the greater had the greatest difference because the yep. theory is like you just said if mm -hmm. my immune system her immune system we combine them. The baby's going to have the best chance to survive because it's got a right wider var variety of protection. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and so like here, I'll I'll give a a personal example because my L my LTR and I are like like our bodies are trying to make babies. Like our bodies are like she is like 
Painty with your cum. Like, she's just like, put it in me. Like, right? And then she's like, I don't know what came over me. Like, I've never been like this with anybody. And, and, and I believe her because, like, our first time getting together, we were just hooking up. Like, it wasn't, it was just normal. I had a bunch of girls. She, I met her. We decided to hook up. And, um, you know, it was like, first time hooking up. Um, I had condoms. <laughs> Very irresponsible, by the way. Do not follow my lead on this. I had condoms in my closet. And I just was like, we're about to go. And she's like, do you have condoms? I'm like, why? Do you get a disease? She's like, no. I'm like, neither do I. And they started having sex. <laughs> what is wrong with us? Our chimpanzees took over. That's the problem. I was, I'm always very careful about that because I don't want to get a disease or get a girl pregnant. Yeah. So I'm always being, and you can't trust her to, you know what I mean? And, and so, I, I mean, I, it was, it was full blown, like didn't care. And then I was like, holy crap. And she was like, holy crap you know like what are we doing <laughs> it, it was our chimps were like make a baby like it was a primal drive and so and this is why guys have to be careful protect themselves we talk about paternity fraud as if women are just doing it intentionally they are often okay but oftentimes they're just caught up in the moment and they their bodies are literally telling them to get pregnant with you and their yeah. decision making is it, they're not clear on it you know what i mean and that's a real thing so you gotta like be the bigger person, which I was not on our first encounter. But my point was, is that <laughs> this is a smell thing. This is a, you know what I mean? This is, there's, there's a chemistry and a lot of things could be personality traits too, that you just sort of recognize body language. I mean, we don't know. There's a lot we still don't know about it, but you'll know from your own experience. I know from my own experience, there's girls that I've had an extreme connection with an extreme drive towards, and they might not even like fit the like characteristic on sexual market value. Like there's girls that I've been with that are like we, most guys would consider a 10, you know what I mean? And sex was good. They're okay. They're hot, of course. Mm. But the, for some reason I wasn't as just drawn to them as maybe like some seven, you Dude, know what I mean? Where <laughs> I relate to this so hard. Yeah. I related right. so so much, man. And, and guys give me shit. I get I have a few dudes <laughs> giving me shit because I mean I like girls with a bit of thickness to them. I love girls with thickness. We're, you're you know, like, speaking my language. Yeah, thick thighs, mm -hmm. a big booty. I'm oh. like, oh, mm -hmm. yes. Absolutely. And then they're like, oh no, dude, she's like fat. I'm like, she's not fat for a start. She's mm -hmm. not. <laughs> 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 she look, I'm just not like I. I don't. It's it's very rare that I have like amazing chemistry with a girl who's like super thin. You know, like that yeah. sort of model kind of look. It yeah, happens yeah. occasionally, but more often than not, it it is it isn't there. So I yeah. totally relate to what you're what you're saying here. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so and so this is and now some of that's like my like my preference for thicker girls might have something to do with my genetics and maybe combining with that girl makes a, a better specimen. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. We don't actually know yet. We're still researching a lot of it, but that's it. That's a chemical or genetic opponent component. That we can't control. Mm -hmm. I can control my ability to produce and have better resources for security, for example. I can control my ability to be a better father. I can't control whether or not I'm going to connect with this person on a genetic level. Mm -hmm. So that is why the sex, she needs to see you as the sexual best as a first and foremost thing. Some of that will be the experience you create with sexual skill, of course. And so you want to Make sure that part's covered. But even when you have that part covered, some are going to connect with you better than others. You want to pick the LTR that connects with you the mm -hmm. best in that level. Because once you solve that problem, the emotional draw becomes easier. With your alpha behavior in your game, she emotionally draws to you. And then the other things can fall in line. Now, as far as frame control, so frame control, going back to the contract, a little bit. So what the contract was actually giving her a set of ideals to get behind, mm -hmm. you know, so she doesn't have to take the blame or responsibility, right, for her behavior, action sexually, but it also gives her, she's owned now by me. So it gives her a sense of, you know, this is a set of principles now. So religion used to do that, used to give women a set of principles that could get behind those principles. And then that would delay maybe the gratification of exercising immediate hypergamy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that would, that would cause some barriers for, to her making a sexual decision that's not going to serve her long term because she now has a set of 
rules and ideals to get behind. Now, higher level game than just contract, which is where I'm at now, is I don't do contracts. I just use pure game to do it. All I do is I say a statement. You know what I mean? Like, well, you know, you know, you know, you're not you're not just you know friends with guys you had sex with, for example. <laughs> You know, this is a statement, right? So that means, okay, well, like she knows she's not going on lunch dates with people she's had sex with before. That doesn't, that's not going to work, you know? If she has had sex with that person before, well, there's a set of boundaries she's going to have with that person so that I am, so that she's abiding by the, the, the commitment and ownership I have over her, mm. you know? And so I don't need to put that in a contract. These are just principles, but she gets behind the principles. And so, Part first first part of frame control in in a in sort of a, a formula I have is programming and that's the initial um, the initial dating and seeing you where she sees you as her best option so that's your sexual market value that's your courting that's the act of sex and creating that good experience for her that's you know gaming her all that stuff happens during programming you know and um, but the you know she has to have a that ideological isolation is the second part where she starts to see this. So what'll happen is like, she's seeing you, she's, she's seeing you as her best. She's having great time with you. Great experience with you. It's unlike anything she's ever experienced. Right. So, so her hypergamous brain is going to go, Hmm, is everyone else experiencing the same thing? Is there something better out there? Like this is how a girl's brain works. And so then she'll tell her friends like, Oh my God, we have the most yeah. amazing time. You'll outsource the, the, <laughs> the hypergamous thinking to yeah. group All right yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had the most amazing time yeah. this is why social proof works yes same, same principle right like, they can't they can't know for certain based upon their own experiences they literally right. cannot know they have to get that information from the whole of female society to figure it out yep yep because they're they're more wired into the opinions of their social environment. That's just how women grew. Men, men evolved by producing and got getting results through producing resources or protection. Mm. You know, that's the value he brought to the tribe. She brought, uh, her value was her ability to utilize resources, which often meant collaborating with other people in the tribe, which meant that that's why women are very good socially. They're usually better than men socially. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so there's their social circles and all that stuff. They're usually a little bit more developed, but they also rely on social proof for decisions that they're making. They don't always trust their hypergamous or emotional brain. They want social proof and to, to help them with those decisions. So when she's having an amazing time dating you and having amazing sex, all this stuff, she'll tell her girlfriends about her, the sex she's having. With you. She'll tell all, have these conversations. And when they don't get it, then she'll be like, hmm. And then she'll come back and she'll go, yeah, you know, it's telling so-and-so like, but she's like, she, it's like, she doesn't understand. She doesn't get it. And then you're just like, yeah, well, babe, not, not every, most people don't have the connection we have. Most people aren't having the kind of sex we're having. Most people, you know, and then she's like, oh, holy, sh holy shit. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. So whether or not she's religious or not, doesn't matter, but it, this now gives her a what they call idealized ide an idealized isolation it's it, mm. it's isolation in the sense that she's not like everybody else in this re this relationship is unlike anything else that everybody else is experiencing and then you can even say like a, how i frame marriage because i don't agree with it in our society you know well you believe in marriage i go how many successful marriages do you know how, how's your parent how are your parents dealing with that how are your Oh, I've been a lot of divorces, right? I like having sex with you and I, I want to be with you for a while. So I think it's probably better we don't get married. You say something like yeah. that, statement of fact. And then it's like, hmm, you know, yeah. Like, and then it, getting it further into it, it's like, well, yeah, marriage is a broken institution right now. You know, I want to know that I have to bring the burden of performance and so does my partner every day to the relationship. We got to try every day. We got to put effort in every day not say some magic words and then nobody has to put in any more effort in anymore. Okay. I'm giving her a set of ideals to get behind just like that contract does. And then it's like, wow, what we have is like beyond a marriage. It's beyond what everyone else 
you see so that's an idealized and women love that's why they love horoscopes and all that bull crap right they <laughs> like to idealize stuff so you get them that stuff and they will start to they'll do it themselves you don't need to give them a whole lot you just give them the ammo and mm -hmm. then their hamster wheel runs with it and they think holy crap what we have is amazing what we have is special when they get to that point they start to turn away from the global sexual marketplace they realize all that stuff out there is just bull, just bullshit. It's all shiny object stuff, which is true to a degree, right? This oh, yeah. is all, you know, this is all what I'm experiencing with this person is much deeper, much better, much more fulfilling than anything else I could experience. And now they're bought in. Now they're in your frame completely and they want to stay there. They might test sometimes when, you know, there's some uncertainty or you screw up, right? Which we screw up all the time as men. So we, you know, it happens and then they might test things, but they, they're not doing it in a way where they want to blow it up. They're doing it in a way where they want to stay in it because they're bought in. And so then the other part of this is that you continue to create these euphoric, amazing experiences all the time. Mm -hmm. And so she gets at what I call dependent on you. She gets dependent on you for, from a neurochemical sense, addicted to you with her oxytocin, the dopamine for the chase to get you sexually, the serotonin dump after the orgasms, you know, those things in, in that oxytocin feeling post orgasm and also during those moments of intimacy and during, and so you are giving those and feeding those to her. She actually becomes chemically addicted. So now she has an addiction. She has a set of ideals. In the beginning, there's the programming where you're setting you're, you're setting the framework of who you are, how you're better than the other people without saying that, just the experiences you're creating for her. The, the ideals and values you have, like I might say, yeah, I would never commit to somebody who's just showing their ass on Instagram every day or make some money off it. I might say that in a date. And then so a girl who's Instagram girl is going, oh, crap, I ain't making any money off this. And I'm not, like, I'm not an Insta, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a porn star. I'm not that right. So why am I showing my ass every day on Instagram? And then yeah. you'll see her start to yeah. purge that stuff. Right. <laughs> and so, and so then that leads to the final thing, which is just maintaining it, which is the dread part. She has a slight fear, not in a, not cause you're a dick and you like to do this. Oh, you're back. There we go. Nope. Nope. He's gone. Uh, uh, there, there you are. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but it's, it's, it's because you're, you know, you're, um, yeah, it's that slight dread, you know? And so you're trying to, you know, she understands that she could lose you and she understands it like just in a, in a regular sense. They're always worried about that. It doesn't matter. They're always worried. But when they start to pull out a frame or whatever, you just withdraw your attention, you withdraw your time. She starts to feel what it's like to not have that presence. That chemical addiction kicks in. She's like, she's not getting the oxytocin right then. She's not getting those good chemicals. She starts to crave it like a drug. And then so she starts to fear a little bit, you know? And so then she just puts an effort in. Just a reminder that, hey, like, if I don't put effort in every day, this could be gone. And you need to know that too, as a guy, if you're not putting in effort mm -hmm. every day, you're, it's all, it's gone. Right. And so you create this, that's the, the formula for frame. And if you create that frame for a woman, it doesn't matter what she's doing or what she's done in her past. As long as she's capable of pair bonding, that's the trick. She sees you as her best and she hasn't destroyed her neurochemical ability to pair bond. Mm. That's the biggest thing right is that if she has gone through tons of notches and just ran through her body and just ran through her emotions through toxic relationship after toxic relationship she might not be able to get the oxytocin and the dopamine serotonin the way she needs to get it from you as a partner so being with you is just going to be dull it's just going to be blunted you know mm -hmm. it won't be there that sexual draw and, and that, that, you know, it'll be a release, she'll orgasm, but it won't be that same thing. And that's a problem, right? Unfortunately, today we have a lot of women because of how they're running their lives, they're not capable. That's not every woman, all right? We don't know, but certainly a lot of them, you know what I mean? And so that's what a guy is choosing a woman. He's got it. 
doesn't matter how good you are at frame. I know because I'm really good at it and I couldn't keep certain girls in it because they weren't capable of it. They have a personality disorder. They're not going to do it. They have an attachment disorder, psychological issues. They can't do it. Mm. And it's just they can't. They're not capable. You know what I mean? And so that's the thing that guys need to really look for is the capability. But if they're capable and you do all this stuff and you're her sexual best, dude, you beat it. You you win in this. You know what I mean? You, you'll you win. And that's what guys need to look at. So harem or monogamy. <laughs> first of all, that was fantastic. Everyone who's, everyone who's watching right now live, <laughs> you better smash that like button because Paul is dropping some fire right here. Okay. <laughs> So start with that. (laughs) Start by smashing the like button. So the second thing I'm going to ask there is how do you, is there a way that you uh, sort of vet or test to see if she has the potential to even pair bond? Is there anything that you can uh, add to that? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, I'm looking at, I look at red flags, of course, you know, so Rich Cooper has a red flag chapter. I like to promote his stuff because he's an awesome guy and he, we work together a lot yeah. and, um, you know, the red, the red, red flag chapter is good, but here's the thing about that though. Red flags are not hard stops. Generally, some might be, but most of them are not hard stops. Okay. They're just something to look out for. And what a guy needs to do is take his time. Because during that honeymoon phase, as we know it as, she is going to get all the chemicals of the newness of a relationship. If she has been stimulating a polyamorous drive rather than a pair bonding one for most of her dating career, she is going to be attracted to variety and newness and new dick and all that. And so she's going to have all the happy chemicals in the beginning. So you got to let that let that honeymoon phase wear off. And then see where she's at. A girl who can't pair bond will go through the honeymoon phase and then it'll just be flat after that. She won't be able to get that back no matter what's going on. And that's not a good thing, right? She needs variety to stimulate those neurochemicals. See, we have two drives, right? We have a couple of different drives. One is to pair bond with a long-term mate, but that's been around a lot, like not as long. For 190,000 years, it was, you know, switching partners right and variety um harems give you both give a girl both the variety because she has other girls and there's variety of things happening there as well as the monogamy meaning you know she has that man that provides those things for her and security and he's her sexual best like she gets the best of both worlds in a harem style relationship and she's also Um, uh there's also like a like a very blatant degree of competition anxiety there because there's because there's literally yes. women in the relationship yeah, oh yeah so it adds to it add, it does a lot of things for you add, it mm-hmm. adds to your social proof right it creates comp- a mm-hmm. bit of competition anxiety yeah. and 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 uh, uh keeps her chasing right because there is literally competition yeah. in the bedroom with her right it proves that it sort of mm-hmm. it plays yeah. to her like hypergamous filters because it's like oh well if other chicks are attracted to the guy that i'm fucking already he must be the best option yeah like, right Ex- right that's right you solidify that there's nothing more solid for her subjective understanding that you're the contextual alpha or you're her apex alpha than when she sees you having sex with another girl making that other girl orgasm you know what I mean? She's with you at a part of that. And she sees you dominating her and another girl. There's no other so better social proof. Yeah. And so that's that's really a good thing. That's a, that's another reason that these are, are good structure. Um, but that that being said, so what what are you looking for though? You're looking for um a couple things too, like in her history, did she take breaks? That's a big one. When Mm. she broke up with someone, was she on a new guy in a week or two, you know, or did she take five months off, you know, and that's a big deal because if she was pair bonded, that means she had the chemical addiction to this person. Even when she broke up, knew he wasn't good for her, knew he, you know what I mean? Now, some exceptions to that can be when there's a resource tie, like a marriage where she had been broken up up here for like six months to a year. Then mm-hmm. finally the divorce, right? Finally the separation. And then she's with somebody else. But that I get that. But, 
you know, ordinarily speaking, if she breaks up with a serious relationship and then she is on another guy, that's not an indicator of pair bonding. You know what I mean? Because that that's an indicator of a need for variety to get that neurochemical hit. Mm -hmm. And so if she is like broken up and she takes a break or takes some time off, that's a good indicator, you know, that maybe she has that. Even if she has a lot of notches, you know, her serious boyfriends that were more devastating, she took time. That's that's a good one. It's hard. You know, it's it, the, the best thing, though, really is to just look for committed behavior. Is she doing behaviors where she is constantly signaling to other men and constantly lining up her next options? Or is she doing behaviors where she is like getting rid of these other options to earn this commitment from you and to focus mm -hmm. on you? Mm -hmm. And so if you see that in the beginning and then continuing past the honeymoon phase, that's a good thing. If she is constantly signaling on social media, going on girls' nights, you know, getting drunk with her girlfriends, not telling her been going. We lost him again. Come on, Paul, sort out your internet connection. Uh oh, are we there? I can hear you. I can definitely hear you. Oh, now there's no camera. That's crazy. Um, hmm. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Now you got a, a signal. You see that? It's a helicopter. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually need to actually close this off, though. Uh, I don't know how long you wanted to go today. But, no, this, um, this is good. Uh, how about you just finish up that, that last point, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, you know, so basically that that's if you're – if she is – Xing out her other options and she's looking to focus on you and mm. focus on you as being her, her, her option, her hypergamous brain is going to lean towards wanting to go towards her sexual best. And so if she sees you as that, she's going to X out these other options and be happy to do that. Mm. If she's, you know, inviting other options, that means her drive is, is more stimulated towards variety. Even if she sees you as her best, she's going to always be constantly looking and opening up the door for other men. And if that's what she's doing, she's not worth the commitment. And I tell guys to hold off on giving that commitment away until they see these signs of her. She has to be able to give up the global sexual marketplace for the relationship that you offer her. And if she doesn't demonstrate that she's going to do that on her own accord, without you putting rules down, without you, you know, you just, you just hang out, have fun, show her a great time, drop her off. That's it. And she will try to get you into that commitment and try to show you through her actions that she is willing to throw away the global sexual marketplace. If she does that, that's a good indicator. And then maybe LTR and see where it goes. You know, that makes sense. <laughs> that, that is some fantastic advice, Paul. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for dropping some fire. <laughs> and unfortunately, Thanks, bro. unfortunately we can't see you right now uh where can everybody, where can everybody find your stuff uh plug your, your instagram your twitter your, your youtube everything yeah yeah so apex mindset on youtube that's the best way you know paul benjamin on my social media and apex mindset i mean i'm building a youtube channel so if they if, if your guys have not been over there yet if they go over there and subscribe to my channel that would help me out the most hey well i'm gonna, um, I'm gonna put the link in the chat <clears throat> cool right i appreciate that uh you pull stuff because he's got some fantastic videos on his thanks YouTube. man so, so check it out it's in the chat uh, it'll be in the chat right now there you go guys yep yep and so yeah that's the best way i'm going to have a course on uh more harem and the thing about the harem game stuff which i know we, we, we the intent was to talk more about that but we got off in these tangents but i hope I mean, those are good i like the yeah. time we got off on yeah, yeah. So, but we're, I'm I'm planning on doing a course to spin off of a Rule Zero, the Rule Zero uh, conference. I did an hour on harems, but there's so much detail. There's a dang it! I think we lost him again. I mean, there is at least twelve hours of information, um, and so I'm going to put out a course in that in November is where we're looking at. I have a book in process too. But anyway, the best – it's like in editing. But the best way really is just get on my YouTube channel and because I'll put announcements up and stuff like that, and that's that's the best way for now. Of course, if guys need consulting, I do coaching. Um, I do mindset coaching, NLP, hypnosis, as well as relationship 
consultations and stuff. So that's what, you know, guys want to access me. They can get on my channel. Uh, my email address is in the, in every description of every video, send me an email and, and we'll talk about uh, doing a session. So. Excellent stuff. Thank you so much, Paul. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. I know we'll do this again. Uh, you know. Hell yeah, we will. This is <laughs> I'll have you on my channel too, man. I got to figure out my technology, but we'll do it next week or so. Or this we'll week make or it something. work. Maybe we'll, we'll make it work, about. man. Yeah, you've given me you give me a lot more ideas for things to ask you about next time now. So this is really good. Um, if you guys awesome. are watching, make sure you smash that like button. Make sure you uh, if you if you're new to the channel, give me a subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know when my my streams go live because I have a little bit of an erratic schedule. Uh, and if you really want to help out the channel, drop a comment below in the uh, in the comment section on YouTube. That really helps it show up to, uh, to on the YouTube algorithms and helps us get this amazing, quality, life changing content in the hands of more people. Okay, uh, tomorrow at <clears throat> uh, tomorrow at let me just double check that. Excellent. Yep. Tomorrow at nine a.m. Pacific time, I'm interviewing uh, Tristan Tate, millionaire playboy, webcam pimp. Uh, we're going to be talking about OnlyFans and the porn world versus the webcam world and all kinds of interesting things like that. So tune in in about 12 hours' time. And that's what we're going on then. In the meantime, thank you once again, Paul. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I will see all you guys tomorrow. Thanks, brother. See you later. See you later.